Good morning, everyone. It's uh, so nice to see you here this morning. It's always a challenge to, uh, as to what, what extent we will have an audience on day three of the first session on the morning after the social event. <laughs> and we're also very grateful that our panel who were out last night have uh, actually turned up. So uh, again, um, so pleased I'm the CEO of the Critical Communications Association, TCCA. And we're so pleased to be um, associated with the ENA event and to have been able to participate in the program. And it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce a panel of experts who will be providing some insights today about one of the remaining areas where we need to improve the ability to locate public calling in for um, emergency response. And it's not only in respect to locating callers, it's also important that we're able to provide that location information in a timely fashion accurately, accurately to our first responders. And today we'll, we'll uh, go through some of the innovations that have been occurring in this area that are attempting to improve on the technology that we've you know, so grateful is being now adopted around the world in terms of advanced mobile location. So AMNL is certainly improving the uh, response to emergencies for callers that are within an area where they can receive a signal from one of the satellites that can then be processed back to the, as part of the information going back to the call taking centre. So today we're going to talk about situations where services like AML are not effective. So indoor, indoor locations and primarily one of the, the, the major areas is being able to locate both a caller and a first responder that might go to a, a high-rise building. And we also have an, yeah, other underground situations where the same prevails. As cities tunnel more, motorways have more extensive tunnel, road tunnels. We have the underground metros, we have underground car parks, and similar environments where equally we need to be able to locate a caller and be able to dispatch first responders and follow those first responders as they deal with that particular incident. So there have been a number of innovations around um, being able to provide accurate location when you're in a elevated or subterranean environment where you cannot see the satellites, where you cannot process an AML location. For some while now we've been, there's been solutions around providing a series of beacons in such environments that provides at least one way of uh, determining where a, an individual is in an indoor location. But now we're seeing some other innovations that are leveraging um, other facilities that are available in standard smartphones, some of the sensing that's available, the barometric sensing. There's ways in which we can use some of the position navigation and timing information to augment the position provided through GPS um, satellite location. And when we start to talk about underground, we're now seeing technologies emerge that can replicate the satellite location in underground environments. And some of these have been deployed um, and trialled around the world in road tunnel, metro, subway environments. And these are now in a position, uh, in, you know, are, uh, have evolved to a point where you can get continuous and, and more accurate positioning. And differentiation in a high rise building in respect to which floor a caller or a first responder may be navigating in response to an incident. 
But there's actually three elements to this that need to be in place. And uh, the panel I will introduce shortly will take us through you know, some of the important areas that are required to enable effective location indoors. The first thing, the caller needs to be, have access to a bearer network, a cell phone network, a Wi-Fi or some other medium to be able to transmit that information and is called to the call centre. The other element is having the technology that provides an ac um, accurate 3D representation of that location. And that's all good, but once it gets back to the, the call taking and dispatching centres, that information needs to be presented to the operators on a map system that is actually in 3D as well. And during today we will uh, discuss with the panellists um, where some of the technology is at at the moment, what are some of the considerations, and what are some of the challenges that we, we still need to overcome. So it's much pleasure I would like to introduce our first speaker, and Stuart will, uh, will introduce his role in creativity um, software. And I'll leave it with you, Stuart. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. How is everybody today? Hopefully, there wasn't too many people at Shamrocks last night. Uh, <laughs> I'm amazed they actually did get a good turnout. Just to introduce myself, I am Stuart Walsh, the product director at Creativity Software, and we are all things location uh, technology based. I'm going to introduce you to some of the challenging concepts um, of overcoming uh, 3D positioning, especially in large, dense urban areas. Um, and what are the pathways forward? Um, so the, the whole idea is, if I can get it to the next slide, he says. Got it. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go through this where I'm going to talk about where uh, the technology is today. Um, why do we need 3D technology? Um, and then what are the strengths, weaknesses, and, and the pathway forward? Um, very quickly, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but uh, emergency location today is quite well established from a 2D perspective. We got a lap long, um, and we can pinpoint precisely where they are. Uh, this is near our office. We're based in London in a beautiful district of London called Kingston. Um, and this is the kind of thing that a lot of you will be familiar with, uh, where emergency services are given a lot long position of where that emergency caller might be. Where do you dispatch, dispatch the technology? And that's quite well established, but one of the challenges, even with that still, is not yet universally deployed as technology. Offering emergency services, very high reliability, very high accuracy. And when it comes to 3D, that's going to be a new challenge. The big thing is, originally we had uh, lat long, the X and Y, but now we're going to introduce the vertical part. And that vertical part is the X axis, and really specific here. Uh, this is no specific city, but when we make an emergency call and the emergency caller is high in the building, um, and then when an emergency responder comes, it would be very powerful and even capable of saving lives if they know what floor they have to get to and what entrance they got to get to. Um, you must have encountered this in, in, your, in your daily lives out there. Um, even my own father, who was a uh, paramedic and emerg emergency responder, used to tell me about the stories of he would arrive at a large, tall building and no one in the front desk would know who's the person in distress because they made a call from the 15th floor. And it's the requirement to be able to um, locate in a building, as an example. It could also be underground, it could be in a stadium. Think about all the scenarios when you go 3D. Um, you also need to increase the accuracy. That's really important. Um, it's required to be able to position the caller in the particular building. It's fine that they, you could say that they're on the, say, 14th floor, but there might be 16 offices on that 14th floor. So increased accuracy is, is required. Um, and which we'll talk about today, 3D maps and 3D map sources is critical to the success of this capability. 
So a little bit why, obviously, hopefully this is really obvious, why provide 3D location? Um, you know, the, the whole idea is that finding an emergency caller in a tall or complex building um, represents a challenge. Um, if you've ever been an, out there either running emergency services or actually being a responder, you know, arriving to a building such as this gentleman here and being told, you know, what floor is the, the person on, if they could be prepared, that would be key. You know, the time to find the caller is critical to saving lives. And preparing an emergency service responder so they know which entrance to take and to be prepared, because if they have to go straight up to the building but then they've forgotten something and have to go back down, preparation is key because you prepare to succeed. Um, and that's really key in this process. So 3D location techniques, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. What I've got to say is that we're just starting to venture on this journey. Um, our, my proud, our company, uh, Creativity Software, is involved uh, in helping to find AML uh, with BT and, and our, our, our colleagues here on the stage from Google and others. And we think it's been one of those great success stories. Um, but now we've got to start the journey with 3D vertical indoor. Um, I'm going to kind of introduce you to two approaches um, that we're going to talk about. But it's the, these are just some of the approaches. I think this will evolve and change over time. But they'll be from the handset perspective. What can the handset see when it's indoors or high up or in a tube station or down underground? Um, and then the second one is what can the network itself see? Um, what can it actually build from information-wise? Those are the two perspectives I'm going to talk about. Um, any combination of these approaches can be utilized, and I strongly believe that it needs to be a combination. We, as, as creativity, we strongly believe, and we try to prophesize this around the world, that you need to use multiple techniques to get you the highest level of accuracy and reliability. You don't want it to be 50%. You want it to be close to 100%. So whatever combination of techniques are used, they absolutely need to provide widely available covering all types of handsets, feature to smartphones, the oldest 2G phone to the newest 5G phone. You've got to cover the greatest scope of your population, which is possible. And that's one of the things that's going to need to be taken into consideration with this process. It also needs to be highly reliable. And, and it, you know, reliability is key. And 3D is going to pr present an enormous challenge for us uh, to be able to do that as, as, as a kind of collective in this process. Um, and it's something that we've got to be starting to think about now. I'm going to talk a little bit about what they've been doing in the US, where they've pioneered this, and some of the challenges that they've uh, encountered and how they're moving that forward. Um, <clears throat> in general, we're trying to get to around three meter vertical, roughly getting you a floor. Um, this is always to do with the challenge because accuracy versus reliability is key, but that would be the target. So let's start with handset technique information and let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses. Um, let's start with the obvious one, GPS. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to ask anyone in this audience, what kind of GPS signal do you think you'll get indoors? You will get a GPS signal indoors, yeah? But in order to get vertical where you are, you need a satellite pretty well above your head, as well as a cloud of constellations. So really that one is weak, unless there are GPS repeaters, but then they've got to be all over the country in every building in order for it to be uh, uh, kind of properly dispersed. More importantly, um, did you know that your phone can measure the air pressure? How many people knew that? Exactly, didn't know this. Um, something uh, <clears throat> Google know well, uh, as do other handset manufacturers and operating systems. And it's quite key because it can measure the air pressure of where you are. Now, it's not on all phones, but it is on quite a widespread of, of phones these days, um, being able to use the existing technology within the phone. And that can add the next layer of information. So they can actually measure the pressure and say, I think it's at this level, uh, above sea level or in fact, if it's below sea level as well. Next one, which people would be thinking about is Wi-Fi. In other words, Wi-Fi is in pretty well every building. Um, it's available, the, uh, the phone can see it, 
um, to help derive its location. The drawbacks with um, Wi-Fi is to do with the reliability of that Wi-Fi source, um, making sure that the node is documented, that where it is, its location, and being able to access information on it is key. Um, so there are strengths and weakness to that, um, that needs to be considered. Quite an approach that a lot of governments are starting to look at is beacons or sensors. Um, they, they went this way in the US for, for a fair portion of what they're going to look at and going forward, placing these location beacons around very dense areas, which gives you very good reliability and accuracy. The challenge is cost and time, because imagine how many of these beacons you have to put around. It, it's enormous. It, the, the, they've found this <clears throat> the richest country in the world, in the USA. They have struggled to try and map this out, but they've pioneered it, which I, which I, I comp really compliment them because they've bit this bullet hard, and they're really moving it forward. <clears throat> Finally, the mobile network is one of the, the final elements that obviously a phone can see, and it can ingest that information. Um, but it's about putting all of this together, and I'll talk about that a little later. None of these on their own will provide a reliable result. Um, and that's what we're always about. In emergency services, not only have you got to be accurate, but you've got to be reliable. And we're always about driving towards 100% reliability. And none of these on their own will drive that. But when you combine them, then you start to get some very interesting and possibly very good reliability. The other aspect is network. What can the network see information about that handset, about that subscriber? Um, obviously, mobile networks can identify subscribers, but did you know we have the capability to, actually, it didn't, it didn't quite come out on that, but we can actually measure um, the angle of arrival and angle of departure. So we're able to identify potentially, possibly the floors, <clears throat> but maybe even groups of floors, which can be added to other information. Uh, this is very possible from 4G, but really with 5G, it, it gives us even more reliability and accuracy. So it's a really good source. And with uh, more mobile networks putting femtocells, microcells in a lot more places, it's going to be very powerful um, for this. Obviously, the dedicated beacons I talked about where they can gather information about subscribers, about devices, um, and being able to have that there in the process is, is quite powerful. And then obviously the Wi-Fi network itself. Again, this is from the network itself, and I'll talk about how getting reliable Wi-Fi information probably be one of the key pieces of information for vertical, for, for 3D positioning, um, because of the prevalence of Wi-Fi. It is a great source of information, but we've got to try and drive towards the higher rely reliability of this. Um, again, as I said, with the handset view from the network view, none of these on their own are going to provide us the solution we need. But by combining them, we start to drive that reliability up. We can be more power, we can be a lot more reliable, we can be a lot more accurate. Ultimately, we want to map the path forward. And the path forward really is, there's no magic bullet. And we're only just starting the journey, really, um, you know, we could say we're starting the journey today, <laughs> but it's something that we've got to work together. All of us, all my peers on the stage here, all of you from governmental down to the ground, down to the PSAP centers, to the network providers, we've got to work together to drive, just like we did with AML, to drive a standard for this. Um, stage one location capability is something that I drive very much about. Having all that location information driven through the data centers of the PSAP to employ more about AI, use machine learning to take all those techniques and produce comprehensive high reliability data. And it's something that we're going to be um, kind of pushing with governments and, and hopefully with you guys to help and you know, make this more standardized. Um, we need to bring all the parties together. We need to bring the PSAPs, we need to bring the handset, the OS vendors, uh, the network vendors, the government authorities, um, all of those need to be brought together. And we need to ensure wide adoption. Um, just like with AML, with the help of Google and with Apple, 
it's got a pretty good wide berth. We need to do a very similar thing when it comes to 3D. And my peers and my colleagues here will talk more as, as the presentation goes forward. The big thing really I find with this is to look at government mandates. And whenever you say government mandates, people go, oh my God. <laughs> but really we need governments to get involved in this uh, because they need support from organizations like ENA uh, to help drive those standards with their partners, you guys, and support possible the costs because these things are going to cost, but they will save lives. Um, and we never start the journey, we'll never end. And we really need to start thinking across all the countries you represent here, we need to start representing and talking about uh, driving the standards to do with this. Um, we need to learn from our cousins. How many people here from the US? I've met a few of you. Hey guys, I think I've spoken with some of you. Um, you know, you've kind of pioneered this with the USFCC. Um, you've seen the pitfalls, but also you've seen the successes. Um, and what we need to do is learn what, is, what was good and what was bad. Um, so I'm going to be spending a lot of time um, in our US office there to try and help drive more standardization for the rest of the world. And in particular, I really want to try and drive it here in Europe uh, with all the learnings that we have. Finally, and it's something that um, my final colleague from, from Esri is going to talk about, <laughs> The sources is one part, but for the PSAP, they need to be able to visualize the 3D source. In other words, see which floor, see some contextual local information uh, to be able to say, the entrance to this building is here, and this is the best way to get to that floor. Yeah, use staircase X, use elevator Y. Um, and without that, all of this won't be successful. So we need to come up with greater standardization in 3D mapping. And it's key from that perspective because without it, I don't think this would be successful. 2D mapping has become very well established, um, but 3D mapping, I think, is going to be a whole other level. <clears throat> Finally, just a little bit about us as creativity. We are emergency services location intelligence uh, people. Uh, we were founded you know, over 20 years ago, and we're a wholly owned subsidiary of SS8. Please reach out to us. Um, we look forward to hearing more about what ideas uh, the community has, but also um, we want to try and pioneer this more and more. So if you in your region and your country are interested in starting to try this and test it and try and start putting some frameworks together, please come and contact myself, contact uh, Creativity, and I look forward to seeing what kind of questions we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. And um, we have uh, two or three minutes available if there are any questions that people would like to ask from the floor. If you'd uh, raise your hand and we'll arrange a microphone so you could ask those questions. Any questions for Stuart? It's too comprehensive. There you go. Actually, I've got one for you, Stuart. We've, um, you've talked about the 3D mapping. Um, what's your your thoughts on the willingness of governments to provide some of these uh, 3D map sources? It, it varies greatly, but it is key um, because if you think about the structural information for buildings, um, that is a key source. Um, and without government assistance and, and driving that, the, the, you won't successfully build a proper comprehensive 3D map to support vertical indoor positioning. Without that, <coughs> Um, that's why I said government mandate is key, because they need to get involved. Uh, mm. They can't just throw this over the, 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 the line and say, you, you go and take care of this. They need to drive to ensure there is a comprehensive, starting with the big urban areas. Do they have, and, and that this has been led in the US, where uh, there is a huge amount of structural information available in very large cities. Um, and a lot of cities have that, but it needs to be comprehensive because you don't want to be in the building <laughs> where you're on the 15th floor, you've placed the emergency call, but there's no uh, map, no 3D map to be able to do it. You, you, you don't want to be that person. So it's got to be comprehensive. It has to cover a, a large portion of the population. And not the only people to help do that is the government and the, the mapping and ordinance people of, of, of the country. Very good. Well, it sounds like it's a, an area that we need to concentrate on and advocate 
for some of this to be uh, undertaken between government and industry. So uh, exactly, we'll, we'll put that on one of the action lists for Ina and our Critical Communications Association to see if we can continue to uh, advocate for some of that. Thanks, Stuart. Well, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce a, a duo from Google. We have uh, Micah Berman and uh, Alistair Breeze, who will uh, uh, provide us some um, insights around ELS. Thank you. Good morning, Ina. Uh, good morning, panelists. Good morning to anyone who snuck in for the free coffee break after this. I'm uh, Micah Berman. I'm the product manager for uh, Android Safety, including ELS. And I'm Alistair. Uh, I'm the tech lead for Emergency Location Service on Android. And if we do our job well today, we will have empowered you to understand vertical location, some of the opportunities and challenges it can present, and what it means for you, what you can do with it. So to do that, we'll take it in three parts. First, we'll start with uh, an overview from the top. What is ELS? How does it work? And a little bit about our roadmap for this year, where we're headed. Then we'll peek back behind the curtain of vertical location, talk about why it matters, how it works in, in the case of ELS, um, and a bit about why it's hard, which we've heard a little bit about from Stuart as well. And then finally, Alistair will share some about how you might be able to put vertical location to work for you today through ELS. Overall, ELS's mission is to enable Android users to get help from emergency responders more effectively wherever and whenever they need it. And we do this by providing fast, accurate location when users place calls or send text messages to local emergency services numbers. Our free service is active on the overwhelming majority of Android devices around the world and covers more than one billion users. The system works like this. ELS activates when a user calls or texts 112 or 911 or another local emergency number. The service is on by default, but users can turn it off in their device's settings. And if a user is in a region where a local partner has enabled ELS, it will then compute the device's location and send it directly to the partner's endpoint using one of two transport mechanisms, HTTP or data SMS. Google never receives the ELS locations. The ELS endpoint which is managed by a partner like a third-party software vendor, a mobile network operator, or a government, can then in turn ensure that the location data is available to the PSAP receiving the call. The Android ELS team is focused on three big priorities in 2022. The first is quality. ELS is already reliable, but there's more we can do to make sure the system is as bulletproof as possible. We want to ensure ELS messages can be delivered regardless of geography or network topography, and are resilient to a number of network failure modes. The second is growth. We're thinking about the second billion users that we can cover with ELS, which means expanding into new geographies with different constraints on emergency response. What got us to the first billion users covered by ELS won't get us to the second. And so the question we're asking is, what do we need to build and enable so that more people can benefit from ELS? Finally, usefulness. We're thinking about how we can make the data sent by ELS more useful and actionable for first responders, and in turn, for the callers placing emergency calls. So we're thinking about uh, things like uh, sending device language, which is available today over HTTP, or, for example, uh, sending vertical location information to help first responders better locate callers. So that's a little bit about ELS and where we're headed in the coming year. I'd like to turn our attention to vertical location and some of the challenges that it presents. This is a historical look at uh, ELS location that we might have provided for one call. So you can see in the orange circle, about five years ago we would have provided uh, a location with an accuracy radius that encompassed four different buildings. Today, for that same call, we'd provide a location uh, radius that includes just one building, and you can see that in the green circle in the middle. And if you add in advances in vertical location to the picture, it's even more compelling of a difference between five years ago and today. We go from the picture in the middle, which is our old location radius that encompassed those four buildings, to the image on the far right, where you can see not only are we able to provide a location estimate that includes only one building, but we're able to provide a vertical location estimate that also helps further narrow the search radius. As you've seen the power of ELS, but how does it work? We use something called the Fused Location Provider, 
um, which is a similar concept that, that Stuart sort of outlined, where when you have no single reliable signal, how can you instead look at many semi-reliable signals and combine them into one estimate? And the fuse location provider is what does this on Android devices. And does this not just for ELS, but also for many other applications on your device that might use your location. Um, and ELS is fast and pretty accurate. And it does this by combining things like GPS or GNSS, Wi-Fi, sensor data, lots of other signals into one estimate. But this is still a very hard problem because none of these signals are reliable. Almost every one of them is uh, fallible and often in many ways. And this is particularly true when we think about vertical location. Many of these technologies were designed to compute accurate XY location, not necessarily optimized for vertical location. So you can see some of the failure modes here for each of these sensors. Let's peel back the curtain on one in particular, which is the barometer. Um, it does seem like an easy answer, uh, Stuart mentioned it as well. So if you're uh, you know, a hiker, you might know that uh, the, as you go up in elevation, right, the, uh, the air pressure goes down. And so you can imagine this would be a really uh, useful and perhaps even straightforward way to get a device's elevation. Um, and so we've graphed here, you can see on the right, um, barometer inferred elevation, which means uh, we've taken the pressure and converted it to presumed elevation. You can imagine that seeing a barometer graph like uh, the one up there would indicate a user that has uh, gone down a few floors and then back up a few floors as well. Unfortunately, it's not this simple as you can probably guess. This exact same change in barometer inferred elevation could simply be caused by a weather front moving through the area while a phone was completely stationary, uh, plugged in on a user's uh, bedside table and charging overnight. Uh, barometer air pressure is significantly impacted by weather systems that move through, and thus so are the barometer readings that we can use. So that's a little peek behind the curtain of why uh, you know, vertical location is hard, as well as some of the power uh, that it can deliver if we can get it right. And so to talk a little bit more about how you can put vertical location to work for you, I'll pass it off to my colleague Alistair. Thank you. Thanks, Micah. Hi, everyone. So, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about how vertical location can work for you in your different scenarios that you work for. So starting off, uh, oh, wrong button. There we go. Um, so we kind of think of vertical location in these three different verticals on, on the screen here. So we talked a little bit about use, uh, when, it's, when it can be really used. And so Micah has talked about the kind of dense ur urban environments and tall buildings where vertical location can be really valuable. And something that we really want to emphasize here is making sure that the emergency responders know these scenarios themselves and have the sufficient training to know when and where to use vertical location is also critical in this solution. Secondly, we're going to talk a little bit about interpreting it in the context of the solution. And so any location, whether it's vertical or XY, needs to be displayed in the context of its accuracy and confidence. And I'm going to give a little bit of a deep dive here into why this is critical. And so imagine you open Google Maps, and this is what you see. Um, imagine this pin here is the location that Google Maps gives you. Would you trust this location? Well, the answer should be no, because in reality, we have no idea from this, this kind of display of location whether it's good, bad, high accuracy, low accuracy. And so deep diving into this particular example, you might see the blue circle look a little bit like this in blue ma Google Maps. And we often refer to this as the blue dot. Um, and making sure you actually understand what the blue dot means is also quite critical and something that uh, is really useful for emergency responders. And so typically in Google Maps, the, the, uh, the blue dot is actually what's called the 68% confidence circle. And so what this means is if you have 100 different predictions of where the user might be, um, if you were to take the, the, the most constrained, smallest uh, radius that uh, satisfies 68 of those predictions, you would get the blue dot. And so this is really useful, and, and it's pretty much what we've all trained ourselves to use when, use when navigating cities. But it's really critical for emergency responders to know that this is the case. And furthermore, uh, it's actually possible to not use 68%. And in some scenarios, for example, with emergency response, it can be useful to use something like a 95% confidence radius. Um, and, and this is actually something configurable by ELS. Um, and, and the emergency responders should be hopefully aware that this is the case. Now, vertical confidence is equally as important. So again, imagining uh, if we had this kind of location on a map, uh, it, it looks great. Oh, you must be on floor five. 
But in reality, making sure that you portray this to the, uh, to the, to the reader of the data in, in, a, in, in its context of the confidence is critical because actually, in reality, it might be three or four flaws that we're actually uh, unsure about the, the full position on. And so finally, we're going to talk a little bit about understandability of vertical location and making sure that it's actionable for PSAPs and emergency responders. And so first of all, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how, how we currently interpret altitude. And so generally on GPS devices and, and ELS, for example, and in the standards, uh, the standards um, we actually transmit altitude as what we call height above ellipsoid. And so this is an ellipsoid that's drawn around the world as if it was a perfect, uh, a perfect ellipsoid. But in reality, the Earth is not a perfect ellipsoid. And so if I was to ask any of you right now, does anyone know what height above ellipsoid we're at right now? Probably not. And actually, we're at minus eight. Now, does that mean anything? Well, not really. It just tells you that the Earth is quite a, quite a shallow shape at this part on the planet. It doesn't mean that we're under sea level. It just means that the, the, this ellipsoid is not quite there. And so often when emergency responders receive height above ellipsoid, if they are not aware that this is what they are receiving, the altitude is essentially useless to them. And so there are some conversions that you can do. So for example, you could convert this to mean sea level. And so this is basically a model of the Earth where they take the, the various tidal uh, differences over the space of a year, and then they work out different uh, mean sea levels with respect to the ellipsoid height. And so because of things that I don't understand, uh, I'm not a geographer, uh, but uh, at different parts of the planet, the sea can actually be at, at different altitudes. And so this kind of uh, representation of the altitude can be really useful in some scenarios. Uh, for example, cities that are on, the, on sea level, for example, London, it's, it's got the River Thames, and so generally, most of the city is actually pretty much at sea level. But in reality, most, most places around the world, as we know, are not on the sea. And so the final one we want to talk about is actually, can we go a step further from this and actually represent it in probably the most semantically understandable uh, kind of way for, for the emergency responders? And that's going to be height above ground. Now, the challenge of this, however, is you need, you need a, a kind of a data source for this. Now, I, I give an example here that you can use a Google Maps API, which gives you the elevation. However, in reality, it really depends on the solution that you're trying to build. And often, governments, GIS vendors will have higher accuracy maps. And so you really have to think and work with your local, local authorities to find the best solution for this. But generally, something we should really take away from this, though, is none of these models are perfect. And so there's always going to be some error, particularly with terrain maps. And so it's really key to, again, make sure you're always interpreting these altitudes in whatever formats, along with the confidence and, the, the, and these errors. So finally, we're going to talk a little bit about floor level. Taking a step back, fundamentally what we really want to solve here is knowing which floor to, to, to go and, uh, try and try and find the person on. Now, this is an active area of research and development, and we really encourage you to start thinking about this more. And it's something that we're, we're currently looking into as well. Um, and so what if we could provide floor level? So there are a lot of challenges with this approach. So there's often inconsistent floor labeling. So for example, buildings sometimes decide to skip the, the floor level 13. Um, and also some, some buildings have different heights. So as you can see here on this one on the right, some old buildings have very different floor heights depending on the building. And so it's critical that you, know, you can't just do an immediate transformation of altitude to floor level super easily. You really need to, 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 to know more about the cities that you're involved in. And so scaling this is really hard, but we encourage you to start thinking about it because this is the kind of information that some, some, uh, some local authorities may have about certain buildings in the area. And so finally, how do you get vertical location? So ELS supports vertical location over HTTP. Uh, please reach out to the team if you're more interested in learning more about this and the best ways to use it. We'll be happy to help you. But also something I'd like to call out is we also now even send location floor. As I say, this is, a, this is a research topic, so don't expect this to work on a huge coverage, but it's something that we're starting to experiment with, and we'd love you to start trying to use it in, in scenarios where it is provided. Finally, as a takeaway, I think we've given you a bit of a summary about how the ELS's mission here, and that we're trying to help users get help from emergency responders more effectively wherever and whenever they need it. And I hope as well we've kind of presented the exciting opportunity here that the vertical location could provide for you. But with the caveat that there are some challenges to overcome. 
And I think what, what we should all really take away here is that it, this is a problem for us all to solve together, I think. And that comes to, to the technology makers, the PSAP manif uh, PSAPs, the, the CAD vendors, everyone, we can all work together to make vertical location more useful uh, and helpful for, for emergencies. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, some really useful insights into uh, some of the challenges and some of the um, work that's going on to um, improve the situation. But again, I think you know it's highlighted the, the fact that governments and agencies need to um, take some specific um, effort to understand this and start to, if you like, harmonise uh, the way in which they may be able to deliver such services appropriate mapping that will then allow, allow us to an integrate an end-to-end -end solution. So um, I think those insights are really valuable in terms of understanding just the, you know, the challenges in elevation and representation of that. So thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we've got time for maybe one quick question. If anyone has something compelling they would like to ask now. If not, uh, say that any questions. You, oh, we have one down here on the... To the right. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, I am uh, Amir Bdewi from Intersec. Uh, I have just a quick question. Um, in fact, regarding the barometric pressure, do we have any idea about number of phones that are supporting this feature today? Uh, I was reading that it is less than 5% of the phones. But do you know uh, exact numbers? So, so what's the, if you like, relative population of devices that have barometric sensing in them currently? Ooh, can you turn my mic? Oh, excellent. Um, I did a little bit of research on this um, recently, um, and <clears throat> it's, it varies greatly country by country, and if you look at different reports, some would say that we've, we're, we've breached over 70% phones have that capability. I don't believe that, personally. <laughs> um, but it very much varies from country to country. Um, and I think it will change significantly. I think uh, I did read one report recently um, that might have been in the US is that they were, they had gone over 80% uh, capability, but it very much varies from country to country. Um, and it's hard to get it, but it's about how many phones have been our smartphones are out there versus feature phones, um, but I would say I, I would say 60% is is probably a fair figure. But please don't take that because if you went and looked online, you'd probably get about 100 different figures. So the best answer. Yes, yes, we have uh, sometimes the optimistic that speak about more than 50%, but in some research we say 5%, which is no, it's way 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 more than that. It's 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 absolutely above 40%, I, could, I can be pretty good on that. But again, the key, what we've just focused on, is you don't focus on one element. Pressure, barometric pressure is just one element. Wi-Fi, all of the things that we've talked about will help to drive that up the level. So barometric pressure will only give you one element, as they said. You know, if you're near an elevator, you know, um, you're going, you could get different pressure to being over by the window. Um, so it's, it's really important that people understand it's only one element of the overall capability. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I'll wait for your answer also, but just a quick second uh, question at the same moment. Do we know if in some building, if you have uh, air conditioning, if this will also uh, impact, uh, I'm thinking about cities like in Qatar or in uh, Kuwait, uh, you know, this big building with a lot of air conditioning and sometimes pressure regulation if this uh, impact the measurement? Yeah, so we, we've actually done um, some work out in the Middle East. You imagine some countries out there like um, UAE, Dubai, have significantly cities in the sky. Um, so the air conditioning can affect it, but also um, as you go up the building, um, it, when you get seriously high, you're going to get effects of um, you know, what the pressure might be inside as opposed to outside because, as we just pointed out, weather affects pressure like you wouldn't believe. Um, yeah. And I think what we've all got to do is to come up with a common model here
to be able to say, get, let's use AI to, to say, what's the weather like today? Compensate against that. Where are you in the building? So is that building very high? Does it have significant air conditioning? Is it using kind of sealed pressurized doors? And, and there's a lot of information that needs to be gathered in there. I think what we'll all agree, and we don't, we don't want to drag, drag, drag this too much out, we're only just beginning the journey. The good thing is, and this is why I brought up the US, they started this journey several years ago through the FCC, and they've done a lot of the learnings here. So we're going to be able to take the good and the bad <laughs> and try and drive that more. So you've really got to start talking to us, start driving it through governments, because it, that needs to happen. And just one thing to add on the, the question about phones not having a barometric pressure, we can actually still provide an altitude even if you don't have a barometer in the phone. But, but as, as you said, more and more phones as they get released these days do have barometric pressure. I think a couple of takeaways on that is this is quite a complex area. Two, I think I and a lot of the general public wouldn't even know they have a barometric sensor in their phone, and why should they have one? So, you know, there's probably some education that has to go around um, along with all this, both to the um, influences within our uh, society and to start to um, allow the public to understand why, when they're choosing a phone, these are some of the things they may be wanting to contemplate as part of their choice. So thanks for the insight, guys. And uh, it's with pleasure now I'd like to introduce uh, Francisco Nobra. He is with Esri, and uh, he has some, some really um, uh, you know, useful additional information to complement what we've heard already today. Thanks, Francisco. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, to be here. Uh, it's early in the morning after the party yesterday, so uh, it can be challenging. I'll try to give you an idea on how we're addressing from a GIS point of view uh, the 3D location. Uh, to be truthful, it will be more than 3D, it will be 4D, not, not long ago. So, how many of you have heard about the GIS? How many of you do know what the GIS is? Okay, quite a lot which is impressive, because most people, when I started to work and talk about what the GIS is, I started to go and say, well, look at Google, what they do is a GIS. So, you know how to find your ways inside a space, uh, 2D space normally, uh, but it's a GIS, uh, and have the, some of the characteristics of a GIS. So, GIS provides a framework a system for managing and exploiting geographic information. That's basically the definition. And provides a framework and process to measure uh, all the context in a space. And to be truthful, everything we do as humans have a location and a time. And that location is normally X, Y, and Z. Okay? So, GIS for you. And looking at a GIS, we need to understand which are the areas that we are wanting to use the GIS for. So it could be basically something to provide information as is, so as a system of records. Could be used directly to engage and send people to the terrain, to the field. And finally, to analyze the information to guarantee that we are more aware of what's happening in that space. So the GIS core components are basically system of record, sorry, system of record, system of engagement, and system of insight. And, and all of that is valid for most systems that you work with. And this gives you an idea where we are uh, on implementing GIS. A GIS is not more or any more a system that is basically used by specialists. It's something that should be used by everyone within the organization. And to be truthful, we've received information from sensors, uh, iPhones, uh, Google phones, Android systems. So all of that is part of the information that we receive. Uh, we have foundation data. Foundation data can be the maps that your 
uh, mapping agency in country will do. So looking at UK, the Ordnance Survey, and, and so on and so forth. L'IGN en France. So that's that. And that's normally the information that you probably received inside uh, your PSAP, inside your emergency room. And all of that needs to be encompassed in the geospatial infrastructure. So it's not more a desktop, persons working very high end, specialists working in the desktop, it's something that can provide information throughout the space. And that's geospatial infrastructure feed up intelligence, so understanding the space, planning, and providing information to the public. And if you're looking at PSAP, we are working on an operations and situation awareness context. And all of that needs to be transmitted to the space outside. So the interventors, uh, the first responders, and, and so on and so forth. So the good thing of this thing, this map, mental map, is that we can work both ways. So this is not a line, it's a circle, because all of these intervenients outside uh, of the office will provide information back to the system. Okay, so we can guarantee, or we should guarantee that we have inf the updated information everywhere, anytime. And what is the main objective, or the final objective, is to create what we nowadays call a digital twin. A digital twin is a virtual representation of the real world, okay? It encompasses not only the space, so the traditional map, but will encompass human geography, will encompass any level of information that is needed to operate your own system. And that gets us to what we need to understand, is that the information you have probably is part of your digital twin. And that digital twin the information, looking at the 3D, uh, goes from a level of detail zero, where you can just have the digital surface, to digital terrain model, where you all can wrap off over the information of the imagery on top of the map. So you can get something like this. Level of detail one, as we call it, is just the same map with the buildings extruded. So just a block explaining the, the, the building. Level of, level of detail two, we can start to have the roof models and surfaces including the vegetation. And, fi and finally, the ones that we work mostly at the moment is level of detail trays, uh, detailed models of features and surfaces, okay? Uh, if you look at our colleagues from Google, if you look at the images of the buildings, you'll have that, hopefully, that level of detail in most situations. So this is something that is achievable, achievable now by most entities. What is really difficult to achieve is the level of detail for. So the internal models of the buildings is costly. And as you heard my colleagues talking about, um, trying to understand how you are inside the building implies quite a lot of efforts. And just knowing the interior of the buildings implies quite a lot of effort. So we need to address several problems until we get the proper 3D model inside uh, PSAP or any other emergency management organization. So we need to be able to have migration tools and be able to query the space on 3D. We need to be able to understand the space inside the building and the building itself. We need to be able to characterize spaces and visibility spaces. We need to be able to measure on 3D. And all of that implies 3D migration, migration tools, implies indoor location and routing, collaboration with BIM, building information models, and improved <coughs> GX capabilities. And 
to be clear, z-axis, we're talking about altitude, but for the first responder, what they need to do, I understand, is the height of the building, the height of where the call is being done. And to do that, you need not only to know the altitude, you need, as our colleagues were saying, be able to compare what we call a digital terrain model, that's the terrain without anything on top of it, and then the DSM, the digital surface model, where you have the heights on top of the digital terrain model. Sorry. So this is uh, something that you already seen, the possibility to identify in a 3D model the situations happening, but with a precision uh, space where you can act. Because in the end of the day, you not only know, need to understand where uh, the, ins the uncertainty of where the height is, but at the same time, the X, Y position has some uncertainty too. So to provide something inside a building, you need to guarantee those two measures. And those two measures, as you've seen, can depend on a lot of things. And there is no really fiable system to pinpoint with a certainty of 95% uh, where you are at X, Y, and Z. So this leads us to what we have outside, to what we have inside the buildings. And to do that, uh, there is quite a lot of technologies, but endogenous positioning systems are starting to get in. The question is, how much it costs? And it costs quite a while, quite a lot. So what can we do with indoor positioning? We can do analysis on how many people normally are on a specific space. So all the analysis that you're traditionally seeing in a GIS can be done indoors. The question is, you need to understand the space of the building, how the plants of the building are made, where you have the bathrooms, where you have the offices, where you have the elevators, where you have the stairs. All of that needs to be properly mapped. And those plants are normally not available for most people. But nowadays, if you have those things up, you cannot, you cannot only navigate inside the building, but you can navigate from the outside the building to the inside. And these are really examples. So this is our campus in Redlands, and this is our main building inside that campus. So we can go directly from the position of the call and navigate from where you have your emergency vehicle going through the streets, getting inside the building, defining which door is the best one, and then going inside. Could have been a 3D map, but look, look what? Um, give you an example. Some years ago, one of the major system integrators in defense provided on a system, the capability to navigate in 3D. So providing the maps in 3D for the offices working uh, in, a, in a vehicle. Who can tell me if that was useful or not? So what they found out is most of us are used to see things in 2D, not in 3D. So looking at maps, we are used to understand the map and understand how to navigate inside that space in 3D, in the terrain, whatever. Most of us are not used to use and see a 3D map. So the mental leap between seeing in 2D and looking at 3D, or looking at 3D and seeing 3D, it's completely different. So they needed to retrain all the drivers, they needed to retrain all the officers. And the same goes, uh, I would imagine, for most people 
uh, looking at the PSAPs or the first responders, looking at something directly on 3D needs time to adapt. So what we are doing is providing information that can be understandable. So things like go inside the building, go forward, take the stairs up to level O2. So all of that information is more readable for an operator because you'll have his device and can understand exactly, well, I, get, I need to get through that door, I need to go to the stairs, go to floor two, then turn left or turn right. So those things are understandable. If you provide him a 3D map, he's trying to look at what he sees in this device and trying to navigate throughout the space. So there will be two different things. Can you tell me who is normally able to see 3D quite easily nowadays? Any idea? My colleagues? Kids using 3D games. So most kids are more apt to really understand a 3D space looking to the 3D space. So the newest generations will overcome that for sure. So, some final notes. One of the things that we need to understand is that we need to start preparing for 3D. So, that implies in the renewals of the systems and preparing new applications to be used inside a PSAP, inside an immersive room, whatever, to the field operators, so first responders. We need to prepare all of our systems to guarantee that they use 3D. Most of the current systems are prepared to use 2D at the most. So needing to prepare systems and apps uh, for 3D. And that's something that needs to be happening now, basically. We need to prepare data. So the data that we provide and have now is basically 2D models. So we need to understand how to overcome and pass to 3D models. And finally, and essentially, we need to train. We need to train the people, we need to train the operators, we need to train everyone to understand where we are at. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Cisco. Like me, I hope uh, many of you in this audience have learnt something that you didn't know before, and I think you know, this, these presentations have highlighted the effort we need to make as a community of um, professionals working in the critical communications and uh, uh, first responder, that we take some of this awareness back to our circles of influence so people become aware of the importance of some of these elements. Implementing 3D mapping, making sure buildings have coverage so you can take advantage of some of these innovations that are coming along. If you don't have a building with coverage, then some of this is useless. And likewise, you know, we need to make sure that ultimately the public are educated in terms of the devices and the benefits some of these will bring to their daily life, whether that's navigation, effectively being able to communicate with a call centre. And more importantly, um, if we get this right, the sort of rich suite of features we can deliver to our first responders to make them more effective in these circumstances. And um, I hope everyone in this room will take these insights away and make a difference in their environment. So again, I'd like you to uh, put your hands together to thank our expert panel. And um, thank you so much for being here on time, actually making it to the first session on the last day of a conference like this. Uh, we now have a complimentary coffee break outside um, until 10.40 a.m. Uh, we ask you to come back uh, to the auditorium here because uh, at 10.40 we're going to have uh,
Colonel um, Pierre Bepo. He will be uh, talking to us about preventing forest fires taking place, um, and this will be in this particular plenary room. So go and get dosed up with caffeine, and we hope to see you back for the next session. <laughs>